Hey everyone, welcome to the 345th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Nathan Blackwell, Turtle, Ethan Eskelson, and Benjamin Willis Teff. We're going to talk more about you in a second. But before that, I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. And I want to give Nathan, Turtle, Ethan, and Benjamin a heartfelt apology because through some error on certainly my part because i'm the only person who touches the patreon we saw that you guys were putting in 15 dollars, but did not realize that oh shoot we owe you four hats so that's on me i apologize your 15 dollars hats they're in the mail they're packaged i just bought some brand new packing tape just a, a little bit of context at the end of last year, we decided to raise the price from $15 to $20 for the Just Shoot It hats because it just seemed to be the right thing to do at the time. Inflation, you know. Yeah. And then we were getting people at the $15 level, and I was like, okay, well, that's nice. We were number to twos, but yeah, I appreciate it. I guess it's what our hats used to cost, but maybe th- these people don't want hats. And then just yesterday, I checked our Patreon page, and I noticed that we never actually changed the price of the hats. Here I have been not mailing hats to all these people that joined at the hat level. And Nathan, Turtle, Ethan, and Benjamin are are the last people. Nathan Blackwell's been uh, a listener for a long time. Long time. time. Very apologized. Turtle, uh, he was on Entourage. That's Mm -hmm. all I know about him. Ethan uh, sent me a message on Facebook and said, hey, here's my address in case you want to mail me the hat. And Ethan, he's from Sacramento. Shout out, Ethan. Yeah, well, not everyone's perfect, you know. Matt's from Sacramento, too, just so you guys know. Yeah, Lady Bird is pretty much about Matt. It is about me. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, today we have Claire Scanlon on the podcast. She is a director that has directed everything, basically. She started out as an editor, was an editor on The Office. She won an Emmy for that. You know, she's part of the ACE, Honorary Guild, like the ASC, but for editors. Since then, has directed Kimmy Schmidt, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Good Place, Mindy Project, she edited the pilot of the Mindy Project. Trophy Wife, Suburgatory, Hello Ladies, Modern Family, Son of Zorn, Last Man on Earth. Fresh Off the Boat, Blackish, Never Have I Ever. Ghosted. Glow. Good Place, Never Have I Ever, Miracle Workers, Rutherford Falls. Anyway, so it truly all of the best comedies in the last 10 years. It's really, really awesome. So exciting to have her on the show. It was a real treat to talk to her. She's got a new movie out. Uh, available on Amazon November 18th. The People We Hate at the Wedding, starring Kristen Bell, Allison Janney, Ben Platt, Randall Parks in it. I mean, pretty much every actor in it is famous. Before we get into it, I want to let you know how you can get your own Just Student hat at the $20 level <laughs> on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Pod. It's a place you can go. If you like this podcast, if you feel like you're getting anything out of it, Give us a dollar or two. We will spend it on paying our editor, paying for our various things that cost us money at $20. You can get a hat. will be personally mailed to you by me. Maybe my, one of my kids will draw something on the box. But yeah, patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. Check it out. Without further delay, except for perhaps a word from our sponsor, let's talk to Claire Scanlon. Well, Claire Scanlon, thanks for coming on our podcast. Um, We were very excited to talk to you because you've worked on like every single awesome show ever and you came up through editing, which is really cool. Like it, you know, makes us feel like you really know how comedy works, you know, like from like a basic component level. Um, And you just directed a new movie, The People We Hate at the Wedding, that's coming out on Amazon Prime on November 18th. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like how that movie came together? Let me just say thank you so much for having me. <laughs> a woman named Ashley Fox, who worked at a company called Film Nation, once upon a time went to a wedding where she met somebody, I want to say, who mentioned this book, People We Hate at the Wedding. And she was into her cups, I'm going to say. But it stuck with her. And she read the book, loved the book optioned the book from Grant Kinder, and then had Wendy and Lizzie Molyneux um, draft a script, create a script for it. And um, Wendy and Lizzie are very well-known comedy writers who work on both Bob's Burger and created The Great North. So they're very, very um, ensconced in the comedy world as well. And I read that script. So I got that script. I don't know if um, it went to a lot of people, but I read it and immediately appreciated its humor. And I really liked its poignancy and heart as well. Because for me, 
especially in a long form comedy, you need a skeletal structure upon which to hang the jokes. Mm-hmm. And like in the office, you have um, a vulnerable Michael Scott, who yes, is a buffoon every day at work, but that's because his mom screens out his calls at night when he's all by himself in his office. And you, um, you see him in that vulnerable moment and then you root for him and you don't care that he's making horses ass out of himself every day at the office to find a friend, <laughs> you know? So mm-hmm. for me, I'm always looking for those kinds of stories that, that do have heart and have a point. And this had all of that in spades and it was like a, you know, three siblings and a mom. And that's the story of how they all came to be drawn apart and in their dysfunctional family way. And then, um, reintroduced to each other in a hotbed of um, alcohol and a party at a wedding. Mm-hmm. High stakes too, right? It's like a, a wedding I mean, is a great spot for a wedding. A wedding is yeah. just, I mean, inevitably it's, you know, high drama, like mm-hmm. even in like real life, there's, especially when it's a destination wedding, you're already feeling shitty about yourself. You know, that's usually when someone finds a a friend and they go hook up, you know, that's mm-hmm. usually when you don't want to be alone, or at least that's been, not my personal experience, but what I have witnessed at many, many weddings. <laughs> Lots of inadvertent hookups late, late at night. Were you a fan of wedding movies? Like, I, I as no. you're talking through it, I was like, oh, that's right. There's a lot of wedding movies that there I love. Are. And yeah. I think that the reason why it it's like, again, like um, you get so many opportunities to explore these like heightened situations mm-hmm. where you can throw lots of disparate people at a situation with alcohol. I keep coming back to alcohol, but mm-hmm. I do think that that helps, you know, if you're feeling great, then you're feeling sappy and romantic and happy for the person getting married. If you're feeling less than, which a lot of people are when they, they're like, well, they have happiness and I'm not anywhere where I, any achieving any of the markers, but we're the same age. And there's a lot of to compares to despair going on. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I think that makes it, you know, just a perfect, you know, fertile territory for a comedy. And of, of course the, the, the biggest one that comes to mind in, for me is Four Weddings and a Funeral. This one was in shot in London as well. So it was always like mm-hmm. the big looming, you know, elephant yeah, yeah. looming in the room. Sure. But, you know, I don't mind having that one. I mean, we actually shot a scene at the same place where Andy McDowell and Hugh Grant have sex for the first time at that wedding where she then leaves him and he's like, whoa, 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 why are you leaving? <laughs> it was this great place called the King's Arm in Amersham. And it's just like from the 1400s and reeking of culture and history. And, mm-hmm. and Hugh Grant. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Hugh Grant, yeah. floppy hair and low ceilings. And you hit yourself on the door jam because it was <laughs> short in the 1400s. So this movie, is this your third feature that you did? I don't know that people would count Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Kimmy versus the Reverend. Mm-hmm. I would count that as possibly the hardest thing I've ever done, which was technically a movie, but no one ever counts that as a movie. I, I, even I like forget the, about it. That's the choose your own adventure. It's a choose your version. own adventure. Yeah, yeah. It is a weird thing that broke my brain. Um, <laughs> truly broke my brain. Hardest thing I've ever done. The one people the call it the black mirror of comedy. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I talked to the director of Bandersnatch. He was really encouraging. But it was hard. Set It Up was the first feature I ever did, and it is streaming on Netflix. And I think it was great to come across someone like Matt Broadley, who was like, this is a good script. You seem like you know what you're doing, Claire. Go for it. And he really greenlit the project right away. It fell apart at MGM. So um, it was in turnaround. And I was like going everywhere to try to pitch it to different people with the producers and the writer, Katie Silverman, the producers, um, Julia Berman and Justin Nathie. And it was like, people were like, oh, maybe, maybe. And then in the room at Netflix, greenlit, boom, done. And of course I didn't believe them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I actually, we were in New York prepping and I went off to Lynchburg, Lynchburg, Tennessee, I think is where Jack Daniels is made. And I did a Jack Daniels commercial because I was like, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. And we were in prep, but that's how I just was jaded of things actually coming to fruition. So, um, I because you tell your t- so, so people are prepping you're like i'm gonna go do this jack daniels commercial yes I, that's exactly what happened and i was like seven months pregnant were you skeptical that it was gonna follow yes. through because you'd had yes. previous movies that fell apart i just feel like the feature world is very different than television and just i think that's just my my personal like way of 
like being superstitious in a weird way. Like it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to do my job, but like, I don't believe it. It won't really Mm -hmm. happen. And then Mm -hmm. it kept happening. Like, and then when we were on day one and then I was like, when we started shooting on day one, I'm like, I think this is gonna, this is happening. (laughs) But I really was cautiously, I don't know. I wasn't even optimistic. I was just like, not jaded either. It was just kind of like tempering expectations. So Mm -hmm. I wouldn't get too sad. You know, I just didn't want to get too excited. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like in commercial world, like my EP back in the day would say just like, until you're booked, like, and basically on set, just tell people you're available. Uh, Because, you know, there's always this like, well, I might have this thing coming up. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell people I'm not available. And then like everything falls apart and then you have nothing. Okay. So this was technically maybe your second, like kind of regular non, non interactive feature. Now there's this article that, came out in 2018 when and the ringer claire scanlon directed yeah. every comedy you love this year and just to give you the caveat of that you know, yeah the movie was based on a, a website and the website that katie used was the ringer so oh. it's very meta that mm-hmm. the ringer mm-hmm. ended up calling me mm-hmm. for an interview i mean i think it, it was all very genuine but it was i don't even think the person interviewing me knew that like lucy oh, was supposed to be the head of the ringer you know, right. the sports, the, I can't even remember the name of the guy who started it, the guy who was really popular on ESPN. And then he created a whole other thing and then it became really popular. Right. But anyway, sport. that was a tangent. Yeah. 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 So I guess <laughs> I'm wondering, like you, obviously you have this reputation as a, mm-hmm. as a person who directs all of your favorite comedies, right? Yeah. And so when um, people come to you with all the people we hate at the wedding, which, you know, is based on a book and like, is it already at Amazon Prime? Is there already like a Kristen mm-hmm. Bell and an Alice and Janney or like how, what are the pieces, like where does Claire fit into putting the puzzle together? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where are you in, in terms of getting it made basically? Yeah. When I read the script, then I w- came on board, Ashley greenlit me as a hire and Ashley Fox. And then Ashley and I gave feedback to the writers. They went back and wrote another draft. It was just based on notes, my thoughts. And that's pretty typical when a director becomes attached to a project, they kind of give their feedback on like, this would be hard to shoot. Like there was a lot of scenes um, in the airplane. And I was like, this isn't very, that's very static. <laughs> I was like, there's not much for me to do if there's, so I think they pared down some of the airplane stuff. I was like, let's bring in some split screens. So, you know, it's a little bit more dynamic and um, that helped just with like the more sedentary stuff. Um, so just like it can be something logistical like that. Like this isn't very visual, you know, mm-hmm. there's just, but to, um, I don't understand why this person does that. Or is there a way to, you know, I don't know, tighten this up. This is a bit long. Um, I'm all for the audience is an incredibly intelligent group of people. Everyone's been raised on the canon of film and television I'd rather them have to play catch up than signpost and then move on. And like, you're mm-hmm. going to see this. You saw this. You just saw that, you know, like I'd much rather. And I'm not saying that that's what they had done, but I'm always looking for places to cut more. Um, and then um, at the time, Mike DeLuca's company was also a co-producer. So it was Film Nation where Ashley Fox was and Mike DeLuca and ironically, Ashley's husband, Johnny, was um working for Mike DeLuca. So it was a co-pro with those two and they were looking for a distributor. And then MGM was interested as was Amazon. Um, And there's no irony lost on me that Amazon won, which is great for the movie because they gave us a bigger budget. And um, then of course, who knows what would have happened with MGM because they were absorbed by Amazon. So I guess Amazon wins anyway. (laughs) So um um, at the time, Ben Platt was the first person that um, signed on. And before a- before you have Amazon, like there, the movie is not financed until no. you attach an Amazon, right? No, right, because Film Nation does self finance, but this one was too big. This one mm-hmm. is a bigger one. They self, they do it, yeah. but they're not. They'd rather package it and find someone to finance it. And and like just an out of curiosity, like I, you know, we're not asking for the numbers or anything but how do you right, determine right. before you have the cast how what how big is? how big it is yeah yeah because i know this one it's like takes place in the u.s in london but other yeah. than that i feel like you could probably scale it up and down 
Right. And I think, I think, um, I think it's fine. It was $25 million. I think the budget and I think went up to 30 million at some point. Um, and, um, Chandler will tell me if that's okay to say. <laughs> I'm very much an open book, so I don't care. And set it up was $15 million. So this was double the budget of set it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and set it up was like a pretty dynamic, like a lot of locations, a yeah, lot of casts. By the way, set it up had yeah. two days of stage work to fill the tax credits. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were on set, I mean, on on location. I really love that. I know it's it's harder, but I really love that. Um, and this movie too, we shot 30, 36 days, 37, I'm trying to remember what it was, 36. I, I've forgotten the, the numbers, but 36 days and um, 37 locations, I think it was. Oh, wow. And um, no soundstage work, zero. Awesome. Not even, and I was so pleased. There was no stages available in London to do. They're like, well, we could do the night black cab scene on a soundstage. And I was secretly <laughs> like, I hope you can't because Aqu- Aquaman, Ant-Man, The Flash, and sure. like, call my agent. They were all shooting and had all the stages. And so as a result, we used a process trailer and pulled a black cab all over, you awesome. know, yeah, yeah. all over London. And it's so much better for it. Like what a great backdrop, you know, and all of our car work was process trailer. And so grateful for that. And I um, feel like half the time I can always tell when it's green screen or LED, yeah, it's an yeah. LED screen. It'll look yeah. great. It, it, it looks okay. I mean, do you know the scene I'm talking about? This It's great because, you know, in London, there's all these... It's like all this old architecture, this beautiful architecture, and these garish big billboards that are video screens, just like Times Square in the middle of like this gorgeous architecture. And so it like they like flash on our actors' faces. It just it's that's what happens in London. You know, it's great. I want to dig in a little bit because I think you've got a great example in terms of just like shooting practically. There are things that you probably wouldn't have shot a plate or like made the decision to have these kind of garish right, billboards right. lighting people's faces or it'd be a technical issue or whatever, you know, you, you, you wouldn't have even occurred to you. Are there other examples uh, of why you prefer uh, location work to stage work in the rest of the film? I think actors act better. <laughs> like a oh, really blunt. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Love that. Yeah. I think they are, I think they're better actors in a location. Like I, I mean, do. Just since you're you won an Emmy for editing The Office, which is <laughs> I know we never <laughs> left. It did. It would go all over deep in the heart of Van Nuys. Um, that whole there's like a whole section of like that one episode where Michael gets on a train. That's because we were by the ugliest train depot. <laughs> like it's like <laughs> everything happened because of where we were in Van Nuys. Right, but uh, well, and that famously, right? Like that set, uh, you know, you could shoot three hundred and sixty, and it, you yeah. know, like they, there's the mythological stories of like people having to work in the office for the first week and just kind of like answering phones, like that role right. playing sort of exercise yeah. that Ken Quapis made them do. Sure. Yeah, it's yeah. So great. Um, you know, I think it was, that was perfect for the story you're telling there. Like, even I would think, like, if I were an actor on my way to work to deep in the heart of Van Nuys, I'd get pretty depressed too. It's <laughs> good. it's like the ugliest part of it. It's not a, you know, it's on Satakoy. It's really, really bleak. Yeah. Um, and it's not. It's just not a residential area at all. And so it's a lot of um, factories and industrial warehouses. So um, I always thought it was really good for the characters you know, the actors to get into character going to the physical Chandler Valley studios Mm -hmm. that said, I think that particular project really benefited from the lack of um, diverse locations, you know, Mm -hmm. whereas this, both this and set it up, they, they both to me, like set it up as a bit of a love letter to Manhattan. And this one is definitely a Valentine to London. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it takes the piss on Americans, you know, the Americans come to town and make a bunch of trouble. It's not the Brits. So I think hopefully British people will love this movie. Sure. The the <laughs> Americans are the, the people you hate at the wedding. Basically, Correct. Right? They yeah. are. Absolutely. It's it's and specifically it's Kristen Bell, Ben Platt and Alice and Janney, three delightful people. So to see, you know, everyone turn on them is like, what's going to happen in order for that to happen. And it's worth it. I mean, that they are, they are worthy of landing in jail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kristen Bell is pretty mean. It's pretty mean in the movie. <laughs> She's pretty, she has a lot to work from. <laughs> she, what's great about her is that it's really hard to root for someone who's behaving badly. Mm-hmm. You know, she is 
like what is that called like the she's just you know the anti-heroine basically Mm -hmm. and you're not used to that being her her in general you know and even in forgetting sarah marshall it's hard to not like her Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know she's supposed to be unlikable and she's so likable and i think the same holds true for this film you know so you're able to almost it's that same thing i was mentioning about michael scott like yes she's doing some pretty unlikable things however you see her in a moment of vulnerability and you see how low she feels about herself so usually people with low self-esteem are also reinforcing that with bad behavior mm-hmm. you know and she can't seem to get herself out of that whole vicious behavior and self-sabotaging right and so um, oh, sorry go, go ahead man. I, I was gonna say um so the speaking of the cast it's a really awesome group of people, right? But, I, you know, it wouldn't take a genius to take a look at that cast and go be like, oh, I see, like, you worked with this person in that TV show and that person in that TV show. And that's both, that's true for Set It Up as well. How much uh, <laughs> of, of the relationships <laughs> that you kind of built maybe while you were shooting television, did, did that, is that just coincidence? Are you vouching for them? Are you giving them a call? How, does, how well, do you put those Flat out with together? Kristen... With Ben, I'd never met him before. Mm-hmm. Ben, I didn't know. I mean, I saw him perform on stage, Dear Evan Hansen, but he was incredible. I'd not, I'm not of that musical theater world. I don't know anything about musicals, which is ironic since both Kristen, everyone's like, is, are they going to sing? Are they going to sing in your movie? I was like, oh, right. just a comedy. So once Amazon had won that bid, as I mentioned, they were like, hey, we like these people. And I was like, well, I like Kristen Bell. And I actually know her because our kids went to preschool together and um briefly and also i know her from the good place why don't i just reach out to her directly because let's be honest more often than not that's the fastest best way to get to somebody is just go to them (laughs) versus like reaching out because i also kind of knew i i'd already thought about her for this project and her agents were one it was covid and still is but also her agents were really clear she doesn't leave la she doesn't leave la and so i said what i'm just gonna ask and I shot her an email on a Friday night, forgot that it was Mother's Day weekend, even though I am a mother. And I said, hey, um, wondered if you might be interested in, in reading this. You know, we're shooting this this summer. And she got back. She's like, yeah, shoot it. And so I send it to her. And the next morning, I get an email from her saying, how fast can you shoot me out? And I was like, that bodes well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the answer to her question was one month. Wait, and, and in London, too. In London, shoot her out for shoot her in London for one month, and her entire family came. I do think that all of us being there, you know, with this idyllic weather, I think global warming, but it didn't rain much at all in England, um, which also helped production. I think all of us being there, being kind of like in our like own little bubble, because mm-hmm. we really were scheduled to such a degree that we couldn't have down days. It wasn't like like. Aquaman that like owned Randall Park for the whole mm-hmm. six months, you know, whether he got COVID, it was fine. They just restructured, they just owned everybody. We literally couldn't have a shutdown. It would have, we couldn't have done it. It just wouldn't have happened. So, and we didn't, we were one of the few productions that didn't have a COVID shutdown in the fall of 2021. And um, it also lent itself, lent itself to everyone really bonding. Mm-hmm. And you really get a sense of that, you know, as the family, you know, people hanging out and, you know, just staying at the same hotel and just sure. going for walks together. It's like a month long wedding, right? Yeah. It was, it was without the drama. <laughs> All the drama was on screen. So my family was there for prep, but for shoot, they had to go back to school. So I was away from my family for seven weeks, which I would not do again. Just that I'm sure mm-hmm. you can appreciate that. I wouldn't yeah. do that. That was dumb. And, and I now know that like that was a huge learning experience for a working parent on a set. So I, I know that. I would say like my favorite surprise of this, like I knew Ben Platt was funny, but when it was great, like the crew didn't know everyone as well in England because they're British. So they're like, Oh, he's a famous singer, but they did. And everyone was like, he's funny. Like, <laughs> it was great. He was like a lovely, happy. I mean, I knew what a great actor he was. So I, I wasn't thinking, but it was fun watching the crew be, discover him really. And that there were a couple of moments like that. There were moments like that with Karen Sony, who's an amazing improv actor. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the writers weren't able to be on set, sadly. I wanted them. I always like writers on set. Katie was there every single day. She did an EPK at one point. She was gone for one hour. And she's like, that felt so weird. <laughs> you know, I'm like, it was an hour and you watched the rehearsal. <laughs> You're fine. 
But um, when they, sorry, Lizzie when, would, just I just want to dig in on that for a second. When you have a writer on set, are you ever like, hmm, I think there's like a funnier way to say that. Like, what? How do you use oh, yeah. the writer on set? I mean, you, I use them. I, I work with them nonstop, and I'm just like, hey, any alts, any thoughts? This isn't landing. Um, I think we should cut this couplet. You know, mm. like just you know what I love about comedy is you can't fix it in post. If it's not funny on the day, it's not funny. You know, I feel like drama, you can color time it down. If it's messed up, you can add voiceover. You can have really cool music. You can thwart the chronological, you know, flow of the whole thing. You can mess with the chronology of the scenes. But comedy, if it's not funny on the day, it's not funny. So that's the pressure of like, this isn't working or, and I love that pressure. I mean, it's kind of horrible, but at the same time, when you fix it, it's like this great, you know, Mm -hmm. uncomfortable feeling that I hate love <laughs> that's that makes thing. it so hard but then also i feel yeah. like yeah you walk into a location and there's like a weird doorway or something and you're like oh is there something about like yes the blocking yeah. or something that could be funny mm-hmm. yeah that wasn't in the script? definitely done that yeah just inherently like on the high line it's a funny place like just random people walking in it's weird <laughs> structures all over the place and some of it is art some of it you're like what is this happy accidents happen all the time which is great can I yeah. just digging a, just a tiny bit deeper on the the logistics of your of your process? Is it something where you're asking for punch up after, say, a blocking rehearsal? Are you are you like alting in close ups? How does that work for you? I mean, What's... well, to that, I mean, if I go back a little bit, sometimes you do a round table at the script mm-hmm. level with a group of comedy writers, and and that's always helpful. Even if it, you don't even get that many jokes out of it, you're like, okay a bunch of really talented comedy writers just sat in and we tried to punch up the script in any way, shape or form. And it's pretty bulletproof Mm -hmm, at this mm -hmm. point. Then you go out to shoot it. And then it's just like, yeah, exactly what you were saying. Sometimes you do as scripted and usually I treat the script as Bible. And, you know, initially I really want that version. I very much respect what the writer did. And there's a reason why I signed on to the project. It's the script. (laughs) And so, um, but then, you know, if there's like a fun run or alts, those are always fun. I mean, with Karin, we did it all the time. With Karin mm-hmm. Sony, he, he couldn't help himself. And also because the writers weren't on set, sometimes like there was this one actor um, who Ben knew. I just wanted to make sure we had some good, you know, for me, everything's in reaction starting from my training at the office. You know, it's, I have all the comedy plays and the reactions. And I just wanted to make sure on the breakup scene, they're on a boat. And I wanted to make sure that we had good people reacting. I was like, if you have any friends in town, just bring them and they can be background and I'll make sure to cut. And then this one was great. And so we gave him a line and I was like, Karin, we need to give this guy line. Like, let's work. And we, Lose. he's Karn so fast and so funny he's the guy who said you know Ben is losing his mind and shouting he's like you don't you don't see me you don't see me and he's like but we can hear you and <laughs> that, that was something Karn just came up and it's funny and he, you know it was and that guy was thrilled because I think that was his first speaking line in the movie hey. and, and he's a stage actor he's it's a, a nice really payday right singer. there yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, same thing with Randall Park. He came to set. He's like, I'll just be an Easter egg in the background because we're friends. So like we walk around Hyde Park and we didn't know what to, that was why I was saying we didn't know what to do with ourselves. We weren't with our families. We're like, what do we do? Our, we don't have unstructured time in our day <laughs> on the weekends. We like, I have like gymnastics, gymnastics. and soccer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't have any. I, I was like, what? It was kind of like mind blown. But um so he finally came by on the very last night of shooting. He and Andy Buckley both came by and, um and Ben, I think just finished shooting um, uh, a comedy about a musical summer camp and he had some jokes and um, we gave a couple to Randall and that's when um, he said, this is, it's much better than, I'm going to forget my movie. Much better than that. Cats, much better than cats where they all, where they oh, were yeah. all played by dogs. I it's so bad. I don't remember. Um, it's been a minute. I've got a lot of other scripts in my head. Sure. The sure. TV shows I've done subsequently. Fair but um, but yeah, it was very sweet. And and we just like threw that at him and he did it on the fly. He's wearing his own clothes. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I think there's something fun about that spontaneity. And that's very much something I got from the office. And I think when you create a fun, playful, 
familial atmosphere on set, it carries over. You want to be careful. You want mm-hmm. to be too much fun on set, but like it's still work. It's, but at the same time, I think this like reverence almost can kill some of the comedy. You know, I, I once at a job interview said, you know, you can't be funny if you're afraid. I always try to make a set that's not scary. And then it was Judgy Cohen and she's like, but you could be funny when you're terrified. Like, <laughs> Touche, you're absolutely right. <laughs> she's Judgy, she can say that. She's yeah. absolutely correct. Is that, I'm I'm curious about that. So you probably meet with a lot of showrunners to decide, yeah. for them to decide I mean, whether, I work with them too, yeah. Right, or I mean, to be as you're trying to, get a job job. to direct the show yeah Yeah. oh for sure yeah you i mean very very rarely unless i already know like for instance on not dead yet dean holland knows me but i didn't know case casey or david really who are the showrunners and i had to meet with abe sylvia and kate taylor for mrs american pie and what what do you tell them to convince them that you're the right person for the job you know honestly like i mean i can make a joke or something but the truth is um it's half the time I feel like it's just a chemistry thing, whether you click or not. So oftentimes that goes well. Um, but another thing that I, I hope I'm known for is truly my preparation. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what other, like if you were to like ask a few of the showrunners that have worked with me, that's what they would say that I'm notable for is the preparation, which allows for a more casual, calm vibe on set. And and allows for a certain playfulness once you've got the scripted version. Let's do a fun run. You know, let's go back. Let's try this. Let's have fun because we're usually ahead. Mm-hmm. I'm not bragging. That's not always the case. These past two days have sucked because of the rain. <laughs> we had all location shooting. We shot through lunch today. Um, in order at 2.30, we knew the storm was coming. And we just like blew through everything. And we were working with Rhea Perlman and she was phenomenal. So I work very closely with the production designer. And because um, usually on comedy television shows i don't get much time with the dp with the dp like on a feature i go through each and every scene with them we have overheads and we literally sit down oliver stapleton and i every saturday like we did as much as we could in prep then we we ran out of time and had to start working so then we would meet every saturday and we would get together and we would just look at the overheads we talk about dynamic starts always looking for dynamic starts i'm always looking for cool ways to transition from one scene into another What's an example of a dynamic start? Like um... a dynamic start, like I'll tell you in television, if you have a dynamic start, you better make sure your actors are also talking in it in the shot. Show is yeah. 20, yeah, in the shot, talking <laughs> or, or talking get... and coming, finding the shot. Right, so right. it's just movement. So I would say, like you, you boom down from something, you're tracking back, you're telling a story within the shot of the frame. You know, if someone's hungover, you start on a bottle of tums and you track back and you reveal the person and. Um, the foreground of this, you know, it just depends on what the story is. I always try to tell a story in the frame with, with no words, Mm -hmm. but then also then the next thing is you add the words. So, I mean, as an editor, if you did like a dynamic start just to like set the stage and it's just like a beautiful shot of LA and then you find you, you slowly tilt out to see your actors on the top of a hill, you know, Mm -hmm. overlooking Legion park. Well, Mm -hmm. that's going Um, in a 2135 show. That's that Joseph Gordon Lovett movie. (laughs) <laughs> 500 days of summer yes <laughs> yeah well that's a movie um sure. a tv show doesn't allow for that so i would have to have joseph speaking <laughs> and he, they'd have to be talking and then you find them already mid conversation right, like a pre and then i'd have to cover yeah right. you pre-lap yeah. it and then i'd have to cover my ass anyway and get them on camera doing it in case the show I was like how the hell did you do that i remember once doing fresh off the boat and i knew notch um the showrunner always like to be on the actors and no movement. Like she doesn't love dynamics or she wants to just like make sure the jokes land. And I did one, it was like a voting. It was like, I will appropriate for today because it's um, election day. But um, Randall Park's character was hosting um, like a voting site. It, he was where people would go and vote at his um, establishment, his eating establishment. Yeah, and polling, I did a polling place. A polling place. Yeah. So I did like, it was all this like polling gear and I just, Panned across, panned across the polling and landed on Randall. And I know she was annoyed that I didn't just have one that started on Randall. Was he t- I was like, geez, that is the whole point of this is that his establishment yeah. is a polling place. And I was like, nope. Like, but, it, you know, it's a story that. reason. You're not just being fancy in that case. Right, right. right? No, that was not me being fancy. But, but, um, 
but you know, that's the thing about directing for television is every showrunner's got their picadillos and not just amazing. So, um, you know, she knows the, she knows the visual language of her show better than I do. I'm a TV journey woman director. So Mm -hmm. as many episodes as I can watch, I do, but then at the same time, she, so I just try to always channel the showrunner in situations like that. And then what's nice about features is that I am essentially the showrunner. So, you know, in, in television, the showrunner's king or queen and features the director is. Do you find that like, if you can do one camera move, it should be at the beginning of the scene? Yeah, beginning or end or something, if something uh, happens in the middle, um, but typically beginning, beginning or end. Um, And then also um, when I was talking about transitions, I mean, the perfect example is Mike Nichols, the graduate, when Dustin Hoffman's going through the motions and then he kind of lands on Mrs. Robinson out of the pool. But, um, you know, that's like thinking about how one scene transitions into another. And that's like the perfect example. But um, you can just do it lots of different ways. I'm always I'm, like so many episodes of TV. I tried to like, let's transition, like let's have a montage that's like constantly moving and you go out of one right to left into a black flag. And then you come in, you know, you put all everything together. Like wipe, so it's yeah. Just, yeah. So it's just constantly moving and you're telling every time. And I realize like, I always do a static version of that too, because again, in a, in, when it's when it was like glow or something, maybe I could pull it off, but because that's not exactly twenty one minutes. But mm-hmm. in twenty one minutes, what are you, it's so hard. It's so hard. I remember well, in the office, it used to be twenty four thirty, and then it was twenty three thirty, and then it was twenty two thirty, and each minute hurt. Sure, they cut down. Sure, for more advertising. Well, I, basically, it's just you know, if you have to choose between a cool transition and a joke, they're going to always choose a joke. Writers yeah. are in charge. Yeah. 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 Unless the transition is funny, right? I mean, the, yeah. the worst example and is like, we are not going there. Cut to you're there, right? Yeah. 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 The question that our friend, Eric Kissack, who's been on this podcast yeah. a bunch of times, told me to ask you, which is probably, I'm guessing maybe the answer is connected to prep. I don't know. But he said to ask you what email you send to the crew before a shoot. I do this. I, I do this. So I do the schematics. And usually in TV, I do them by myself. And I just think about those things. I just mentioned the dynamic start, where the actors need, what need, where they need business that the actors can be doing that pertain to the scene. Um, I just don't want people standing around talking. That's dull. And um, Do you and think then, about lighting at all, like at the, that point? Yeah, yeah. Like, for instance, we just shot a scene with these two characters, and it's the first time they've seen each other in six months, and they used to date. And definitely wanted it to be slightly more low lighting, a little more romantic. I mean, it's in a pop-up bakery, so it was still pretty mm-hmm. bright, but just like, you know, taking our time, had some push-ins, you know, tracking in shots and it was sweet. It was really sweet. Such good actors. So it was very, Gina Rodriguez is very good. This was with Ed Weeks as well. And I know him from the mini project and it's, it is kind of fun in comedies how it's a small world, but before, and I just sent this email out to the crew, I send the crew my schematics that I've gone through with the DP and the one like half hour quick lunch I get with the DP on their poor, the poor DP on their break because you don't have any time with them. I just say, you know, Hey, you know, like for instance, today it was like shout out to locations for securing a lane closure and getting this great space to make this pop up bakery in Culver city and shout out to transportation who got everyone there safely as well as the equipment and, you know, it was kind of crazy weather. And wait, so you send the email at the end of the day. You're like, hey, great day. Yes. And it has tomorrow's work in it. It seems, you know, like, hey, it's shout outs and it's giving you a preview of the work tomorrow. It seems really great. It's a little, it, it's not as altruistic as it seems because I'm getting people to already think about tomorrow's work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, every minute counts in production. So even if someone's saying, oh, I shouldn't put my gear over in that section, I should they're clear because the cameras are facing in that direction that could save like 10 minutes yeah you know if someone doesn't know where we're shooting yeah so every little thing helps and then um, i tell them i'm always looking for dynamic starts and cool things if anyone has it there's no idea that i'm not willing to listen to i'm like if you see something say something and i only look better if everyone else shines like if i'm smart i sit back and relax and let everyone kick ass Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that so much. And, and I feel like I'm seeing a little bit of a, of a theme here, Claire, where you're just there's a technique to 
keeping things efficient and light at the same time, right? Like that doesn't happen by accident. And people always say like, oh, that, you know, it trickles down from the top. But you can't just be like a cool, mellow director and just hope that everything works out, right? So what are the things you can do to set things up to make sure that everyone is successful as possible, right? Because I, we've seen right. the opposite, right? Like you see yeah. the director that's like, dang it, I, I told everybody not to put this here and now I am screaming at them because all of the, I'm wasting 10 minutes because the gear is in the wrong spot or whatever. Like we, you've seen that happen before and it's such a bummer, right? But also, like- Yeah, I feel like screamers don't, that's the moment you shout or scream at grownups is the moment you show you've lost control. What I do when someone's very not good and they make a mistake is I wait till the moment passes because there's nothing I can do about it in the moment other than fix the problem. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, like way after, because everyone's calmed down, I pull them aside and I have a nice conversation and Mm -hmm. say, let's try to do that differently next time. And if they don't, then it's another conversation. And sometimes there's a change made, you know, that's it. Like there's no need for high drama. I do think that, you know, the the downside of what I do sometimes can be that I, ma- I make it look like I'm not working hard when I am. Oh, my God, Claire. I, <laughs> that's what everyone says about Matt. You're joking, Oren, but it, it does bother me sometimes when people are maybe a little less experienced is when they'll be like, well, that, that guy's not even doing anything. You're making the joke about like the best case scenario is that you sit back and like yeah. let other people, you know, just do awesome work. I'll speak up if something isn't going the way that I want it to go, but I don't have to be like pointing and like dictating every single thing because, you know, you all know what I want already. We've gone through it a couple times, right. you know, right. like, like I don't need to be standing in front of you watching you do it. And it does bother me a, a lot. I think that some people are like, well, I could do what she does. It's kind of like the hubris that people have with actors. Like, I could act. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, yeah. That looks so easy because yeah. they're good at what they, I could do that. I could do that. Yeah. And, you, you know, that's an excellent, like Allison Janney. Like, I, she makes it look, she, you're like, no, you couldn't. <laughs> like, she's just, she makes it look effortless. Yeah. And you're just like, wow, is she good. You know, like, she's just. I had one last question. I actually was going to ask you something totally different, but now, but the more I think about like how you're an editor and how you're efficient and how you do comedy, the more I'm curious, like something that I struggle with as a director is like, I want to, I want to make my day and I want to be efficient. But when I shoot comedy, I really, I want to shoot like the entire scene at every angle, you know, mm-hmm. like from the beginning to the end, because something funny might happen that I might want to cut to or like there's or a funny reaction point, reactions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but then there's the, the directors that are like, well, I already know what the cut is, you know, so I'm going to shoot for the cut. Like, I know we're going to cut. They're going to look over here. We're going to cut to the POV shot. We're going to see this happen. And then um, like, I only need I don't need to do a three minute take. I can just do the 30 seconds of this take that I'm going to use and not waste everyone's time. Like, I'm curious what what your style is with that knowing like as an editor are you more like let's get all the pieces and see how they fit or are you more like well we're never going to use this so let's only get these two lines on I camera? mean, it depends like i mean yeah uh if it's a master i probably wouldn't noodle with performance but i would let it run all the way through i wouldn't stop it you know odds are they're never going to pop out to the master in the middle of a scene but like that's a good time for people to lock into their lines mm-hmm. and you know I did kind of, we did a wide, an extreme wide shot today and we did do it a couple of times just because I was like, they're locking in and it was beautiful. So I was like, well, what if we do use this the whole time? Like just in case I, I'm a big fan for comedy specifically. And it's something that I always have to work delicately with the DP about is I'm for cross coverage. You know, for me, mm-hmm. there's these moments. I remember I was cutting the Mindy Project pilot and Ed Helms and Mindy Kaling are at Cicada, which is a beautiful restaurant. It was beautifully lit. Vilmos Sigmund was the VP of her <laughs> pilot, which is amazing. <laughs> and Charles McDougall was the director and he's amazing too. And I just remember being frustrated because you have these two very strong comedy people and it was not cross covered in any way, shape or form. <laughs> so I'm having to piecemeal stuff together. And I was just like, oh, they just cross covered, you know, it would be so- I know why they didn't. It's all about beauty. And this is just like, I am ne- coming from the office. It's going to be really hard to convince me that people watch comedy because they want to see beautiful people. 
I think people watch comedy to find something that makes them laugh and relatability is what's key for comedy. And that's why Carol Burnett, who's a stunning woman um, and had her own show and would come out in Bob Mackie gorgeous gowns, would be the most goofy one on set and mm-hmm. be the first to like look like a ridiculous person. And, and you know, Carol was the first to do it. Like, the, you know, not the first person in, you know, Lucille Ball would do, like everyone just, the, the comedy giants are the ones who know like, oh, it's not about how pretty I am. It's about how relatable I am. And don't you empathize with me because I'm going through all this. And it's what, it's the surprise. It's like Charlie Chaplin looks like a hobo, you know? Mm-hmm. He's a tramp, you know, and that makes him funnier, right? So for me, I'm always like trying to make this case. I feel like I try to make it all the time. And and sometimes DPs will, I'll, I'll try to pick my battles. I'll be like, this is a really funny scene. And you have Will Ferrell and Steve Carell. Let's cross cover, you know? <laughs> sure. And on that one, even if you just had someone just, they'd be like, okay, two men, yes. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay. But you know, you have two women and it's just a harder, and, and I want to honor everybody. But sometimes I'm just like, come on, we got to cross cover this. So that's always that's always like a delicate, you know, tightrope that I walk. Claire, so many good things. I'm like, I'm like short circuiting with that. <laughs> how, many, <laughs> how many good things to follow up with? I think there's something wonderful just about having that clarity of perspective for you, right? Like everybody's got a kind of a different sort of ultimate aesthetic that they're they're dreaming of. But like, yeah, I guess it's so refreshing just to hear you know. This is how I like to shoot, and this is the reason why, and I know why you like to shoot a different, but that's that's your thing. You know what I mean? Right, right. Like, for instance, like in the more romantic scenes, we did not, sure. you know, cross cover. Like, if there's a reason, like, and there, there's a reason you want to have those look aspirational and beautiful and mm-hmm. wish fulfilling, you know? So it's not like I'm also inflexible myself. Like, there's times where, and, and, and if I have a really good, like both with Matt Clark, who was the DP of Set It Up, and Oliver Stapleton, DP of um, The People We Hated the Wedding, they're just so talented. Um, and if they, like Matt, if Matt was like, we need we need a crane for this to find our first character. And, all, you know, would, that would be when um, Charlie's running across the street to bring flowers to Joan Smalls, his girlfriend, and he brings the buzzer and she's not there. We're at 51st on the east side and a big crane shot comes down. And it was worth it. And you want to have those moments in the first 20 minutes of your film. Mm -hmm. You want your audience to feel taken care of if this is that kind of a movie. And Set It Up was definitely a rom-com. So you wanted it to be a form of escapism. And hopefully it doesn't talk down to the viewer because I tried really hard not to. And sometimes those films of that genre can. Um, But you do want your audience to feel safe and secure. And Mm -hmm. having a shot like that... Um, Oliver Stapleton fought for a very cool dynamic reveal of Alice and Janney in a dressing room, like coming up and over and seeing them mm, fall on yeah, the floor. That's, you know, that's these are the ways you're introducing your character. And that was all Oliver, you know, so like stepping back and being like, he's right. Oh, he knows what he's doing. It's also, it's just smart when you have like Oliver freaking Stapleton, you know, design yeah. the shot. You're like, yeah, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, and I love the idea of front loading it a little bit as well. Yeah. Just in terms of yeah. like setting the table for people, right? Like. Exactly. Wrap yeah. them up in a nice warm blanket of a crane shot. Right. <laughs> right. That. And I also think music is key in those moments too. Like I've got you. Those are great ways to just calm your viewer down and be like, oh, we, you know, oh, there's someone I can relate to. Oh, that's a cool shot. But they don't even probably, that's probably more subconsciously. They're like, oh, that's cool. There's New York. Oh, there he is running across the street. He's fucked, you know, like right, he's, right. he's not getting into that girl's apartment. And then finally, like hearing something that kind of, you can kind of cheat a little. Not, I try not to use music as a handicap, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. nothing too familiar or something new. In this film, once they get to London, I tried to have most of the music be British. What's next? I mean, obviously you're doing a ton of TV. You're sh- shooting TV today. Any more features or is it really busy with TV? I'm doing an Abbott Elementary in December, which I'm really looking forward to because oh, I met cool. Quinta and Miracle Workers and she's delightful. And also she's a huge fan of The Office. So she got Randall Einhorn to be her producer director. And he did a million offices. And so that look of that show is is definitely paying homage to The Office and Parks. Um, and then there is a project that um, I'm working with uh, Blueprint productions with Graham Broadbent and Sarah Harvey and Catherine Reitman is 
writing this script for um, a studio canal project called Bringing Up Bebe. It's based on this book called French Children Don't Throw Food. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I, Bringing I, Up Bebe also. Yeah, Bringing Up Bebe is, um, yeah, it's, it's just about how the French know how to raise children better than children, we do. Children, <laughs> yeah. And so that's it's, it's written by Pamela Druckerman, and hers is anecdotal, and it's her own experience of mm-hmm. literally being... Um, thrust upon from French society with her kid um, at four. And this, this is more fictionalized version that Catherine took parts from the book and like, you know, the concept of it and basically Pamela's life and turned it into a narrative. And um, hopefully uh, I'll do for Paris, what I did for London and Manhattan, <laughs> you know, that would be a really delightful thing to do <laughs> i'd really love to go to paris and get paid for it sure sure and bring awesome. your family this time right yes and this time i w- i know what i'm doing <laughs> that's right that's why they're in a french school right now yeah. right yeah it, it, you're prepping don't think I, it's all a master plan <laughs> do, your, your, uh, and do, do you still do commercials too or do you not i'd have only time? have done the one i've never oh just the jack daniels just the jack daniels when i was really pregnant <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, I will say I have a wonderful I, um, independent media. Suzanne Pressler is the person I work with, and she gets all the projects. She's always like, "When are you free? When are you free?" And I do have a tendency to book up on television. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, we love bidding against good. people like you that are not available. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it would be nice to do one though. <laughs> well, cool. Do you have just a few minutes to um, do give an unpaid endorsement with us? Sure, sure, yeah. Unpaid endorsements. I'm going to kick it off with two endorsements. The first one, a little bit of a downer. Julie and Julia, the Nora Ephron film. People sleep on that movie. I know that no, most people don't love that movie. I love it. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Um, I don't know if you heard the Julie that the film is based off of just recently passed away. So I thought it would be apropos to bring it back up uh, because it is really wonderful. And um, she changed food writing in a really significant way. Um and uh, there's a really great New York Times uh, article about uh, her passing. But uh, revisit Julie and Julia. It's really wonderful. And then my next one is the podcast, The Screenwriting Life, with uh, Meg LaFave and Lorian McKenna. They're two awesome working screenwriters. They come out of the, the Pixar world. I know the world is filled with lots of screenwriting and filmmaking podcasts, ourselves included. But these two are really craft-oriented in a way that I found really reinvigorating. It was nice to like listen to people talk about actual honest to goodness, like problems and solutions and techniques. You know, Oren's always talking about like, he always wants tips and tricks and like actionable things where I'm a little more anecdote oriented. So I think genuinely you will become a better writer listening to the screenwriting life. If you, if you practice the things that they're talking about, I think there's a lot of really great stuff in there. So Claire, what's uh what are you excited about this week? Well, I just finished. This is very on point. I was trying to think of something. I mean, other than the bombaloni that I just ate, that was amazing. <laughs> oh, no, that's a good it, one. Like literally shot lo- Nutella lava at me um, from Republic. Um, I was. I just finished the Mike Nichols A Life book. I'm sure you guys have read it by Mark Harris. No, I haven't. Yeah. Oh, I thought this. Like you guys have to read this book. It's so good. Awesome. Um, uh-huh. It's amazing. So Mark Harris is married. Not that this has any bearing. He's an excellent writer in and of his own. He's married to um, Tony Kushner, who did Angels in America, Mm. the playwright. Um, But what was so great about reading it wasn't just, you know, learning more about Mike Nichols, but his process is so fascinating. And also what was really humanizing, because you think of Mike Nichols and you're just like, Mm -hmm. his first movie ever, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, followed by The Graduate. You know, it's just crazy. Um, But what was so great is just his failures. (laughs) Like it's good to read about the mistakes he made and things he did and Mm -hmm. how he got back up on his feet and how he approached things differently and how his career really, he kept, it it really took a downward spiral in the seventies. He was making some very unusual choices. And then he paired up with Meryl Streep for Silkwood and Cher. He's the one who put Cher on screen first before anyone was like, she can do drama. He really, you know, found like kind of a new way of storytelling via women, mm-hmm. you know, and, and mm-hmm. he was clearly resisting that at first. And I just was like, this is mind blowing. You know, you think about him and you do think he's like a guy's guy, but then the second part of his career really was embracing more, I think of 
his feminine side and a different way of telling a story than the, the very harsh ways he started. And it's a great book. It's just a great book. And again, I got so much out of how he worked in rehearsals and how he spoke to actors, how he worked with actors, how he messed up with actors and how he, you know, had to pivot and it just, just really great stories. Mike Nichols, a life. Uh, <laughs> the V8 vacuum, my, you know, one of my top five things I've ever bought the Dyson V8. <laughs> uh, there's a, so there's a new target in Silver Lake, but the V8, which is the best vacuum you would ever want to buy. We've talked about it before. Uh, it's usually 400, like 450 bucks. It's on sale at Target right now for $280. So I don't know. If you've heard our endorsement and you're like, I want to get a good deal on it, now's the time at Target. Well, Orrin did talk me into this uh, this vacuum once upon a time, and it, and it, it, is, it is pretty nice. Yeah, yeah it's nice. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, another random endorsement. You know, weather is changing. Uh, we're, a lot of people are using their HVAC systems, you know, their heaters and their air conditioners. And I just feel like a lot of young people don't know that you're supposed to change the filter on those things. So um, if you feel like like your system's not working well, that's probably what the problem is. And my last thing, I was just in New York last week, and I guess everybody knows this except for me, but I had like some black and white cookies. And I've had them before in my life, but like the ones in New York, it's just like a, a different thing. It's like New York Isn't pizza. There, there's a Seinfeld episode about the black and white cookie. That's what a lot of people were mentioning, but I just like these cookies just like blew my mind. They're like spongy on the bottom and like... Like I've had black and white cookies in L.A. and they're just like cookies. Who cares? But I don't know. In New York, I like literally brought a bunch back for my family because I wanted them to like me. Claire, are you do you tweet? Are you on Instagram or anything? I am on Instagram. I'm so, so on it. I don't have a Twitter account. And okay. all of a sudden this week, I'm feeling very proud of this. Sure. Well done. Have- well done. What's what's the new Twitter replacement? Mastodon, I think, is the is the new one. But so so, yeah. where can people if people want to keep track of all of the cool things that you are making and putting I mean, out? I, do, I think my name on Instagram is C L A I R E S K N S K A. Sorry, S C A N L O N. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Claire. If you have questions for us, uh, you can tweet us at Just Shoot a Pod. Uh, we're across all social media at Just Shoot a Pod. So who knows? Maybe we won't be on Twitter for that much longer. Uh, you can find me at Mr. Matt and Low across all social media. And I'm at Smitey Pileg on Twitter. I'm at O Kaplan on Instagram. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. Our producer is Tyler Small. And you're listening to music from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.